Nicholas Sirez lives in Dnipro, Ukraine. He is from New Orleans originally, but bought an apartment in Dnipro where he moved with his Ukrainian fiance four months ago. They decided to live in the city because they found the people nice and the area to be peaceful, according to Reason magazine. Then, in the middle of the night on March 3rd, he woke up to hear that the nuclear power plant was under attack. Sirez said that he has been in a constant battle between whether he and his fiance should stay or should they leave. For the past week, he said his life has been, quote, let's go, let's not go. Journalist and co-founder of Palomamedia.com, Nancy Rommelman, spoke to Sirez about what it's like to live under siege. She joins us now to discuss. Welcome, Nancy. Hey, thanks for having me. Yes, we're so glad you could join us. Uh, it, and tell us you know, where you are, or as, as close to where you are right now as you want to yeah. say. You're in Ukraine. Can you uh, share uh, your, your journey there and how long you've been there? Yeah, I'm in Lviv, uh, so that's in the western part of the country. I'm about 70 kilometers from the Polish border. I've been here about five days. I had to cross over from Poland. That was a bit of an adventure, <laughs> but I got here. Let's see how I, if I can get out. Um, but yeah, I've been here, and I and I, I interviewed um, that gentleman the first night I got here when I was still in Warsaw. I heard about his story and got him on the phone. And he told me what it was like, essentially, you know, knowing that a the nuclear power plant that is, you know, within an hour's drive is on fire, but there's a curfew. So you can't leave your house or you're not supposed to. I mean, this is just maddening. And um, so then he, he told me a little bit more about what it's been like in this country since uh, since February 24th, when um, Russia decided that they, you know, they needed to invade. Yeah, you know, what has what has it been like? What what did he tell you? Well, he said it's been incredibly stressful. Uh, nobody's sleeping. You know, he's up at three o'clock in the morning trying to get what news he can. And you know, his his fiance is Ukrainian. He was previously married to a Ukrainian, so you know, he has some experience in the country. His mother-in-law is in her sixties and doesn't want to leave her home. I've got to tell you, I'm I'm here in Lviv. Everyone here, especially because Lviv is not has not under attack, and you know, cross fingers it won't be. People don't want to leave their home, and you know what they also want to do? They want to fight, and they are fighting. I mean, everybody has pretty much has a new career now, which is fighting for their country. Um, in any case, in the, in this in this gentleman's case, he just was so trying to figure out how to get people to safety, um, and yet. They figure right now they're just going to stay where they are. Then uh, that that might be the safest place for them. So maybe it is, maybe it's not. Is is there any kind of um, uh, conscription that you're aware of? Is it that going on in, in the part of the country you're in as well? I, I know that Zelensky has called for all sort of able-bodied men yes. to 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 join the fight. What, you know, what's going on where you are? Yes, so 18 to 60 across the country, you are not allowed to leave the country. I, I actually was, uh, when I was in Poland waiting to get on a train to come to Ukraine, I saw a lot of um, refugees that had just come off, and it was just all women, children, and older men, no young men whatsoever. So you actually mm. can't leave the country. You actually are not required, but the volunteerism is insane. I spoke with someone, there's a new uh, article up on Reason Today, I spoke with a, a young IT engineer, and he's like, you know, I'm in the reserve and they might call me, but there's so many people volunteering that they probably won't also, I'm better used here doing IT. You know, the country really wants us to keep the country going, keep the economy going, keep things as normal mm -hmm. as we can. So they're, they're very open to using people's strengths where they belong. But I've got to tell you, people are just in the streets. The roadblocks are being manned by basically, you know, civilians they've all decided we are going to protect our homeland and they are i mean everyone it's just a full a full effort to keep things keep you you ukraine safe uh for its for its citizens and, and do the do the people of ukraine have do they have a lot of weapons do they have you know, does everybody have a rifle under their floorboards or something <laughs> Well, they were, you know, I don't know exactly who, but I do know in many parts of the country they were given um, said semi-automatic weapons. It's sort of like, you know, you would go down to the 7-Eleven and get your Slurpee or something. They now, they now wow. have uh, weapons, um, and they, you know, they're going to have to learn how to use them. Um, I forgot the other, the first part of your question. Yeah, I was just asking if if they already had them, but you're saying they're be, being given out. 
They do. And they're also just building them. I mean, you've all seen the stories of, you know, the everybody's making Molotov cocktails. They're making mm -hmm. these things called uh, hedgehogs, which are these sort of, you know, crossed metal things that you stick in the road so the cars can't go. I mean, I've passed, there's lots and lots of roadblocks around where I am and it's made of everything, you know, sticks and then, and then I've walked, you know, concrete and stuff too. And, you know, the children, I'm staying with someone, her 12 year old, the schools are closed, but she goes to school every day and they make nets for the soldiers, you know, to, to kind of camouflage. It really is a, a wow. an all out effort uh, to, to protect people. And what else are they doing around the city? I, I saw that at Lviv is uh, kind of wrapping up a lot of statues and otherwise trying to take care of some cultural artifacts. Like yes. what other preparations so I, are being made for an attack? Well, I, I can't, I probably shouldn't say, and I probably don't know a whole lot about it. I was in Lviv proper yesterday. I'm, I'm a little bit outside of the city right now. And they, they have, you know, they've got some beautiful churches. I was in St. Andrews, which is a, you know, 15th century church. They're, so they're, they're kind of putting wood over um, some of the windows to protect it. But I have to say in the streets, it looked sort of normal. I mean, you haven't had aggression here. You had people at cafes. I mean, I walked into a store, mm. but I also today, you know, I went to a refugee center. I, I brought, I bought some stuff to them and, and, and met some women that had come from across the country. You know, one's mother's house had been bombed, a boy walking a dog in front, just walking civilians was killed because they are shooting at, at, at civilians. Um, I think I remember the, the, the first part of your question, Robbie, was like, do they have weapons? Do they have enough weapons? I got to tell you, every, every single person says to me, please tell your country, we can do this on our own. We have people, but we need weapons. I was sitting with the mm. mayor of this province where I am yesterday, and he's like, we don't need bodies. We need weapons. That's fascinating. Uh, yeah, so it, it must be you know horrifying to see this the beautiful art architecture, the, a, a country with such a vibrant you know culture being you know slowly destroyed from one corner to the other by these in, invading forces. Are there a lot of uh, there are a lot of refugees where you're staying, and are, are they they're trying to get you know into Poland and other places? Well, when I so I I think it's over 1.5 million now. Uh, I did see a bunch uh, getting into Poland, and I have to tell you, I mean, the women I, I interviewed today that I was hanging out with, I gave them some stuff, they literally came with a backpack, like a little child's backpack. That's all they had, because they were just, they were literally fleeing, you know, people being shot in the street. Um, I don't, I guess people are passing through Lviv, they really are trying to get to Poland, but I will also tell you that a lot of people I've spoken to is saying, we're not leaving. No, mm. we're not leaving. And they can completely understand if you want to get your, your wife or your children or your older folks. But even a lot of the women here, they're like, nope, I am staying here and I am defending my country. They are very, very adamant about that. And your, your reference to the Church of St. Andrew is, is, a, is a reminder of some of the other uh, tragedies that are associated with all, with all wars. Because you know, the legend is St. Andrew, you know, the brother of St. Peter, apostle of Christ, traveled to the Ukrainian, you know, what became the Ukrainian region you know, during his lifetime. And, that, and that's what that church is named after. But it's just this breathtakingly beautiful it's artifact. And to think that it, it might just be leveled it's, it, it really is, you know, that's exactly right. I, I walked in there yesterday and I was like, oh my, oh my God, that this, that this could be, and what, for, and what a waste, and for what? And for what? Right, to survive you know, this long. Is, and... that's, that's the other thing everybody is saying. It's like, we're, the, it's just lies, and we're just here trying to live our lives. You know, we're, we don't want this war. Is, is there a sense or an awareness among, you know, the people you're interacting with, Ukrainians, that, you know, it, it's, you know, it's not likely that the U.S. is going to intervene to the level that Zelensky, for instance, has requested with the no-fly zone, with us actually, you know, shooting down Russian planes. We're extremely unlikely to do that, you know, and, and yeah. most people yep. accept that that's not a line we can cross because of the risk of World War III. Do the people you talk to, are they understanding that, you know, like the cavalry to that extent is not coming, even though we're trying to do all these, you know, other things to to corner Putin and, and dissuade him from doing this? 
Well, I'll tell you a couple of things I hear over and over and over. Number one, what I already said, they, they don't even want American bodies on the ground here. They want weapons. Number two, they're extremely grateful to the United States for the weapon we already have provided over the years and are just questioning more. They, they think the sanctions are great, but what Americans don't know, and I'm actually going to write about this today, is that almost all of Russia is extremely poor. 70% of them still, they don't have indoor plumbing. They, they, they don't even have gas. They sell natural gas, but they don't have it themselves. So the sanctions are not going to affect the average Russian person because they don't have the things that we're holding back. Um, and they, they, they just want to be able to fight for themselves. That's, that's, that's the message. I just, it just, just help us fight. Help us fight, but not with bodies, just with weapons. It's just the constant message that I'm getting. Right. Well, Nancy, thanks so much for taking some time to join us. Thank you for having me. Right. Up next, we'll discuss new polling on Russia's energy, on the, on the ban on Russian energy and President Biden's handling of the situation. Stay tuned for that.